I will be diving into an intriguing story that captivated my curiosity since my childhood. It rocked Canada, leaving a stain on its history. So brace yourselves as we explore a chilling chronicle that unveils a series of abductions, unspeakable acts, and heinous murders committed against innocent teenagers. There is a lot to unpack in this story. It was hours upon hours of research, and I also want to give you all the trigger warnings. We will encounter the notorious culprits behind these crimes, known as the infamous Ken and Barbie killers. I'm Stephanie Mora, and this is Wicked Ever After. I just want to have a side note. I got Invisalign recently, so hopefully I will be able to pronounce all my words properly. My mouth is super, super dry. Let's set the scene for our twisted tale, shall we? Picture a seemingly peaceful Canadian town, Scarborough, Ontario, in the late 1980s. It was a place where neighbors watched out for each other, everyone knew everyone, and danger seemed like a distant reality. The economy was good, life was good, and the hours moved at a slow pace every day. But as the members of this small community moved through their daily routines, they had no idea what was about to be revealed to them. From the outside, looking in, Paul Bernardo's home life seemed happy and normal. Born on August 27th, 1964, Paul became the youngest of three to parents Kenneth and Marilyn Bernardo in Scarborough, Ontario. Paul's dad was a hardworking accountant who afforded the family a picture-perfect home with a pool and plenty of space in a nicer part of the neighborhood. Paul's mom, Marilyn, was a homemaker, the perfect housewife, and spent her time volunteering as a Girl Guide leader. To the rest of the world, everyone seemed happy, well-adjusted, and the products of a loving, attentive household. But as you know, what happens behind closed doors is not always what is the reality. Kenneth was actually a heavy drinker, controlling physically and verbally aggressive towards Marilyn, dating back before they even had children. This pattern continued after the birth of their kids, leading Marilyn into a deeper and deeper depression. Because of her mental illness, the kids often went hungry, were forced to wear smelly clothing, dirty clothing, because no one was doing the laundry, and were required to fend for themselves. Admit all of this, Kenneth was s his own daughter, Debbie. Often during family movie nights or after everyone went to bed, often even peeking into her window to watch her dress. I can't even imagine. The rest of the household knew what was occurring, but reports indicate they did nothing to stop it. Even Marilyn, her own mother, knew that this was going on, but she never stepped in, essentially abandoning all the kids to deal with the various levels of neglect that was happening in the home. That neglect and SA became a haunting companion in their lives. The emotional void left by Marilyn's absence left deep, although hidden scars on Paul and his siblings. It was a home filled with tension, secrecy, and unspoken truth that festered beneath the surface. But the most shocking revelation of all came to light when Paul was only 15 years old. He discovered he was the result of his mother's affair. Imagine the weight of that knowledge, the realization that his very existence was tainted by deception. This seems to be the moment that would shape Paul in unimaginable ways. According to Peter Vronsky, the author of The Ken and Barbie Killers, after this discovery, Paul's mother began to call him the bastard child from hell. I can't imagine also calling my children that. Leading him to eventually reject his mother. In response, He began referring to his mother as it and various other inappropriate words whenever he would speak about his mom to his friends. Despite the inner turmoil, the the family continued to put on a successful act in public and very few became aware of the aggression happening inside the home. A few of Paul's friends had noticed some of the chaos and neglect Paul lived in, but those observations never led anywhere. 
it was later found that Paul had been accumulating child, P-O-R-N, images since about the age of 10 and was caught peeping through women's windows on multiple occasions. This seemed to be the beginning pattern of someone who would eventually crave and desire more. The absence of love and stability forced a darkness within him, a void that yield to be filled. It was this emptiness that would lead him down a treacherous path, seeking power and control in the most twisted and perverse ways. Eventually, Paul became a successful accountant, just like his dad, who used his charm and good looks to manipulate women to take them off their guard, leading to all the crimes he would commit in his young life. So as we navigate Paul Bernardo's twisted mind, we must recognize his upbringing, a legacy of neglect, secrets, and the bitter truth of his origins. For in understanding the darkness that shaped him, we inch a tiny bit closer to actually understanding the depths of his depravity. Carla Homoka's early life appeared far removed from the horrors that would consume her in her later lives. Her parents, Dorothy, and Karel Homoka appeared to be an average couple raising their children with care and affection. But behind closed doors, once again, a toxic dynamic brood, helping shape Carla's twisted path. According to different news outlets, her father was very strict and a controlling figure, often resorting to violence and intimidation to maintain his authority. The Homoka household became a breeding ground for dysfunction where fear and tension replace the love and stability every child deserves. As Carla grew older, her escape from this unstable environment seemed inevitable. Fate would bring her into the path of Paul Bernardo, a man whose own darkness mirrored her hidden desires. In October 1987, Paul, who is now 23, met 17-year-old Carla Homoka while she was visiting Scarborough, Ontario, while she was attending a pet convention. The two shared an immediate attraction, perhaps we might call that love at first sight. Paul's charismatic personality drew Carla in like a moth to a flame. They started dating and Paul drove to see Carla twice a week at her parents' home. And as time went on, he began to control her life, deciding how she dressed, what she ate, and actually what she would believe. But despite this, they found comfort in one another, sharing their darkest secrets and twisted fantasies. Their attraction was magnetic, fueled by a shared appetite for dominance and control. You see, early in Paul and Carla's relationship, when Paul was visiting her and he was at her house quite often, Paul started to fixate on Carla's 12-year-old sister, Tammy. Peter Vronsky, again, the author of The Ken and Barbie Killers, wrote in his book how Carla knew about this unholy obsession and often allowed him to look at a picture of Tammy while they were being intimate together. She would also dress in Tammy's clothing while engaging in sexual acts with Paul. At that time, Paul and Carla were living with her parents. And with Carla's knowledge, Paul would creep into Tammy's room at night and relieve himself on her pillow. However, as time passed, Paul's obsession with Tammy went up a notch and all he could think about was Tammy's virginity. This was something he frequently shared with Carla. It seemed he was no longer satisfied with their intimacy in private. He wanted something more. He wanted Tammy's virginity. And let's remember, Tammy at this time was 15 years old. Carla really wanted to please Paul and agreed to give Paul her sister's virginity. I'm not really sure how she's able to consent to this because it's not her virginity to give, but whatever. She said that Tammy's virginity was a wedding Christmas gift to Paul since Carla herself was not a virgin when they met. They came up with a plan that involved drugs and making sure Tammy was unaware of the events being done to her. On December 23rd, 1990, into the early morning of December 27th, after a Christmas party, Carla, Paul, and Tammy all stayed up together to watch a movie in the basement while Tammy's parents and her, their other sister were upstairs asleep. At some point, Carla added halcyon to Tammy's eggnog to get her into a compliant state, which is a sedative. 
and she eventually fell under the influence of this drug. Carla then put halothane on a cloth, which is a liquid general anesthetic, to knock her sister completely out. When she was fully unconscious, they set up a video camera to document what would happen next. You might be wondering how Carla gained access to these drugs. She worked in a veterinarian's office, therefore she stole the medications from work. What then took place was of the utmost cruelty. Paul essayed Tammy, amongst other things, as she laid unconscious. Meanwhile, Carla didn't just witness these acts, but she was told by Paul to participate in these horrific deeds. They each took turns captivating everything on tape. If you really want to know the details of what transpired, I recommend reading or listening to the audiobook, The Ken and Barbie Killers, written by Peter Vronsky. At some point, Tammy came to consciousness and started vomiting from the potent drug that was used. Improvising, Paul and Carla tried to revive her without success. Instead of immediately calling 911, they staged a scene that would lead authority, authorities to believe that Tammy's death was accidental. They dressed her and put her to bed and Carla disposed of the drugs and hid all of the supplies. Once the police arrived, they noted that Tammy's body was moved and that there was a big cherry red mark on her cheeks around her, and around her mouth. Which to me is super suspicious in and of itself. You can see on the screen what I'm talking about. The image is right there. Paul tried to explain away the marks by stating they must have been when they moved and dragged Tammy's body from the living room to the bedroom. Okay, Paul. No. That's not how she got those marks. This is all according to Peter Vronsky, the author of The Ken and Barbie Killers. It's not clear, but it seems the police did not sus suspect Paul after interviewing both him, Carla, and Tammy's parents, who had nothing but good things to say about him. The autopsy concluded that the burn marks were from the acid in her vomit and that her cause of death was choking on her vomit. Because they only tested for illicit drugs, the Halcyon didn't appear on the talk screen. You would think that Paul and Carla would lay low after Tammy's death, but no. Paul's disgusting desires and Carla's need to please him intensified. In January 1991, not long after Tammy's death, Carla's parents left town and her sister visited their grandparents in Mississauga, Ontario. This left Paul and Carla the house to themselves and time to commit another crime because why not? On January 12, 1991, Paul abducted a young girl, took them to Carla's house, and S ate her while Carla watched and dropped her off on a desert road near Lake, Lake Gibson. They called her the January girl. In February 1991, Carla's parents asked Paul and Carla to move out of their home so Carla's parents and sister could grieve. They rented a bungalow in Port Dalhousie, Ontario. On June 7th, 1991, after they moved to their new home, Carla invited a 15-year-old girl who she befriended at the veterinarian office that she worked at out for a girl's night. This young girl is only known to us as Jane Doe to protect her identity. As she previously had done with Tammy, Carla stuck with what she already knew and gave Jane Doe a drink laced with halcyon. Once she was sedated, Carla told Paul she had a surprise wedding gift for him waiting at home. The couple essayed the young girl throughout the night while fi filming the entire thing. Jane Doe woke up the following morning not remembering what had transpired. The young girl thought she had a bad hangover and didn't think anything of it. In August 1991, Carla again invited Jane Doe to her house so that they, the couple could essay her. This time, she woke up and started vomiting, similar to what happened to Tammy. They called 911 for help, but canceled the call once they were able to revive Jane Doe. There isn't any other information on what happened next with Jane Doe other than she survived and never went back to see Carla again. On June 15, 1991, very early in the morning, only six months after Tammy's death, Paul came across 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey in Burlington, Ontario, while he was stealing license plates late in the night in her neighborhood. After attending a friend's wake, Leslie had been locked out of her house for a missed curfew. She had no way to get into the house and nowhere to stay for the night. 
Once she realized she could not get into the house, she sat in her backyard figuring out what she was to do next. And this is when Paul randomly appeared out of nowhere. Paul struck up a conversation with Leslie and it's unclear to me why Leslie didn't seem afraid or perplexed. In any of the articles that I read, it doesn't mention anything. It just says that she seemed completely normal. She asked if Paul had a cigarette and Paul told her, yeah, sure, you can come to my car and get one. So he brought her to her car. Leslie sat in the front seat with the door wide open. And when she turned her head for just a second, that is when Paul took the opportunity to pull a knife on her. He ordered her into their back seat, blindfolded her and covered her with a blanket so that no one would see her. He also threatened her and told her everything would be okay if she listened. Once she submitted, Paul drove to Port Dalhousie, about 35 minutes away, where Carla was waiting for him. For the next 24 hours, Paul and Carla essayed Leslie, filming it all. At times, Carla was participating and other times she was in another room reading a book or taking their dog for a walk. This is really so bizarre and Carla seems so detached from what is actually happening. The tapes that were later played during the trial showed how Paul and Carla again took turns torturing and essaying Leslie as she cried out in pain. It's unclear how Leslie was killed, but Paul is claiming that Carla gave her a lethal dose of a sedative and Carla is claiming that Paul strangled her with an electrical cord, but whatever happened, Leslie was murdered. Together, they put her dead body in the basement of their home and in the afternoon, hosted a Father's Day dinner for Carla's parents, solidifying the sickness that has taken hold of them. The next day, Leslie's body was dismembered by Paul and her body parts were encased in cement. They disposed of the concrete blocks a few days later in Lake Gibson. One of the blocks weighed over 200 pounds and did not sink, so it laid near the shore where it was found on June 29th, 1991. Coincidentally, on Paul and Carla's wedding day. Speaking of their wedding night, what should have been a romantic evening celebrating their nuptials soon became a chilling confession. Paul confessed to Carla that Tammy and Leslie were not his first or only victims. He admitted that many, many victims had come before. Since the late, teen, late 1980s, the town of Scarborough, Ontario had been terrorized by a serial S.A. According to different news articles, this perpetrator would hide in the shadows and wait for young women to get off the city bus alone. He wasn't picky about his victims, just wanted young and alone. After spotting his victims, he would dump them from behind, throw them to the ground, and demand they keep their eyes closed while he brutally essayed them. He would punch his victims, cut them with a knife, and use that same knife to assault them. Many of these crimes took place in the victims' own neighborhoods and backyards, making the incidences even more terrifying. At least one woman was essayed and brutalized in her own bedroom after Paul broke into their home. These dark and horrific crimes rocked the small community to its core. Police investigated every situation and collected physical evidence as well as SA kits from all of the victims. They knew they were dealing with one guy but had zero suspects or leads when it came to who was committing these crimes. At one point, they brought the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit into the mix to create a profile in hopes it would lead them to the man responsible. However, much to the community's dismay, it didn't lead to a single arrest. In May of 1990, two and a half years after the SA began in Scarborough, Ontario, there was a break in the case. One of the victims saw her attacker's face and was able to team up with the police to create a sketch. This image was plastered everywhere. Buildings, TV, newspapers, wherever they could show his face, they did so. Thousands of tips came into the police station with descriptions, names, people claiming to know who this person was. However, there were three tips that came through that all said the same thing. The guy you're looking for is Paul Bernardo. This is where things get interesting. Paul Bernardo looked exactly like the police sketch. He had the same MO and he was a white male living in the area. This intrigued the police enough for them to visit Paul at his home, not once, but twice for further investigation. 
At the time, Paul was living at home with his parents and he told the investigators that he was an accountant, a soon to be married man, and even took the time to joke with the police about how much he resembled the man in the photo. How narcissistic can you possibly be? You would think that this would have been enough for an arrest, but despite being interviewed two different times, Paul was never arrested. Police felt that after speaking to him that he just didn't seem like the type that would do it and instantly fell for his charm, essentially deeming him as not the person they were looking for. However, they did ask for a DNA sample, thank goodness, just in case, and Paul agreed to give one. They took samples of his hair, saliva, and blood in order to test against the DNA found in the victims. They sent the DNA off to be analyzed, but with a backlog of over 40,000 test samples, the wheels of justice move very slow. It was after this DNA was collected and after the interviews with investigators that Paul and Carla would go on to essay and kill Tammy Leslie and several other victims. Paul also continued to hunt, stalk, and SA other women in the area while his DNA sat in the lab waiting to be tested. Paul was the Scarborough SA, and on their wedding night, Carla had just been told her new husband's darkest secret. As time passed, Paul became increasingly restless and more fixated on needing another virgin victim this obsession with taking young girls' virginity got more intense as time went on. Carla wanted to help him fulfill this need, so together they set out another plan to get another girl. On April 16, 1992, during after-school hours, Paul and Carla drove through the streets of St. Catharines, Ontario, looking for young girls they could use for their next crime. On their drive, they passed Holy Cross Secondary School and spotted 15-year-old Kristen French walking home. Seeing the perfect opportunity, Paul and Carla pulled into the nearby church parking lot. It was a time to set the trap. Carla got out of the car carrying a map, pretending to need assistance. Kristen was more than happy to help, and when she came over and looked at the map, Paul attacked her from behind and forced her into the car. From the back seat, Carla seduced Kristen by pulling her hair. When Kristen didn't arrive home, her parents immediately called the authorities. Within 24 hours, an investigative team was formed. Witnesses that had seen the abduction were questioned, and one of Kristen's shoes was recovered from the parking lot. Meanwhile, over a three-day period, Paul and Carla videotaped themselves torturing and essaying Kristen and forcing her to drink large amounts of alcohol and submit to Paul's demands. The following day, Kristen was murdered with conflicting reports yet again. Paul claims that Carla beat Kristen with a rubber mallet before strangling her to death, or Carla claims that Paul strangled her to death for several minutes while she stood by and watched. Despite who did what, Kristen was then bathed to wash off evidence and her long black hair was cut short, probably to throw off her identification. After her murder, Paul and Carla attended Easter dinner with Carla's parents as if they hadn't just committed a nauseating crime like I don't understand, super gross. Kristen French's body was later found on April 30th, 1992 in a ditch about 45 minutes away from St. Catharines near Burlington, close to where the body of Leslie had been buried. On January 6, 1993, Carla was admitted to the hospital because she was severely beaten by Paul with a flashlight, leaving her with two black eyes and broken ribs. She pressed charges against Paul, but he was later he was arrested for domestic assault, but he was later released. While this was happening, the authorities were notified that the DNA samples Paul submitted matched that of the Scarborough SA. He was immediately put on 24-hour surveillance and the police focused their attention on Carla. Carla was brought in for questioning on February 9th, 1993. Investigators expressed their suspicions about her husband, Paul, but instead of confessing to their crimes, Carla expressed the neglect and the violence that she endured and that she was a victim of Paul since they met. This would soon become a running theme in her defense of her crimes. That same night, 
After leaving investigators, Carla opened up to her aunt and uncle where she was apparently staying with since she got um, hurt by Paul. Confessing that Paul was responsible for the SA in Scarborough and that together they were involved with the SA and murder of Leslie and Kristen and that everything had been recorded. She relayed to them that she tried to find the tapes when she left the home but was unsuccessful. Due to all that had come to light, the investigation into Tammy's death was reopened. And that is when Carla met with her lawyer, George Walker, who sought out legal immunity in exchange for her cooperation at this time. Carla was again was placed under 24-hour surveillance. Soon after, Carla's lawyers revealed information about the videotapes to the investigators. Once the extent of Carla's involvement was determined, her lawyer was informed that few, full immunity was not possible. On February 17, 1993, detectives arrested Paul on several charges and obtained a search warrant. However, because his link to the murders was weak, the issued warrant was limited, meaning evidence could not be removed from the property and any and all videotapes found by the police had to be viewed in the residence. It was also stated that damage to the house had to be kept to a minimum, meaning officers couldn't damage walls or fixtures looking for these videotapes. In total, the search of the house, which did include some updated warrants, lasted 71 days. And in that time, the only tape found by police was a recording of Carla and Jane Doe. In a strange, twisted way, Paul called his lawyer, Ken Murray from jail and confessed that the videotapes were hidden in a ceiling light fixture in the upstairs bathroom. Murray found the tape, but hid the tapes from investigators for 16 months, some say 17 months, for reasons unknown. It's unclear if Murray ever actually viewed the tapes themselves, but eventually Murray resigned as Paul's lawyer and his new attorney turned the tapes over to authorities. Thank goodness. On May 5th, 1993, the government offered Carla a plea bargain of 12 years of imprisonment. This was before the tapes were handed over to the investigators. She needed to act fast. Otherwise, this plea deal would be off of the table and she would be charged with two counts of first degree murder and one count of second degree murder. Carla agreed to this plea bargain and it was finalized on May 14th where she pleaded guilty to two counts of manslaughter for the deaths of Leslie and Kristen. Once finalized, she began giving her statements to the police, recounting stories of their twisted acts and sharing how Paul had bragged about essaying as many as 30 women, which was twice as many as authorities actually thought happened. According to news articles, she blamed Paul for her sister's death. She said both Leslie and Kristen were used as slaves before Bernardo strangled them to death. On top of that, she tells them about the years of physical and mental aggression she suffered at the hands of Paul. She says she was forced to participate and lived in constant fear. The news of the horrifying tra trail of crimes was finally out in the open and everyone anxiously awaited Judgment Day. Paul stood trial for the murders of Kristen and Leslie in 1995, which included gruesome and detailed testimony from both Carla and the videotapes of the SA. Paul testified that the deaths were accidental, later putting all the blame on Carla, stating that she was the actual killer, not him. On September 1st, 1995, Paul was convicted of numerous offenses, including two first degree murders and two aggravated SAs. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole for at least 25 years. On top of that, he was designated as a dangerous offender, which makes him unlikely to ever be released. While the community felt relief that justice had been served with Paul, they expressed their outrage over Carla's plea bargain, citing frustrations with the videotapes not being revealed due to Paul's lawyer. Prosecutors had stated that they would never have agreed to this plea gar bargain if they had seen the videotapes first, obviously. So the community was very, very frustrated with her light sentence. The media accused the prosecution of, quotations, making a deal with the devil, end quotations, in for her direct role in the crimes. 
And thank goodness, after the trial, the videotapes showing the SA and the murders of these girls were ordered to be destroyed by the Ontario court. Despite his time in prison, Paul has admitted to SAing at least 10 other women in attacks not previously attributed to him. Most were in 1986. A year before his SA spree began, he also is suspected of other crimes, including another series of SAs in New York, but he has never acknowledged any involvement in these. Paul became eligible for parole in February 2018, but on October 17th of that year, he was denied full parole. His next parole hearing took place on June 22nd, 2021, but it took only one hour of deliberation by the presiding judge for his application to be turned down. It seems unlikely Paul will ever be a free man again. He is currently 58 years old. As for Carla, she was released in 2005. Yes, she is out there. When she settled in Montreal, in the Montreal area, and married the brother of her lawyer and had three children. She legally changed her name to Leanne Thiel, also uses Carla Leanne Thiel and Leanne Bordelais as a way to avoid being found. She later moved to Guadeloupe to get away from the media and her children so her children could have like a normal life. I don't think your children are having a normal life, Carla. You're a murderer. But around 2016, she returned to the Montreal area where she is with her three children and still resides today. It's actually pretty creepy how close she lives to me. Um, Like, really eerie. As we close the chapter on this daunting story, many, many wonder, was justice actually served? Was Carla a willing accomplice or just another victim of Paul's acts? I believe that she was both. I believe she was a victim, but she deserves to be in jail right now for life with Paul and she should rot there. That's just my opinion. We will never know the real dark truths that bubble under the surface, but let us never forget the beautiful and innocent girls, Tammy, Kristen, Leslie, Jane Doe, and the many others that fell prey to Paul and Carla's sick desires. May their story serve as a reminder of the resilience of survivors, the pursuit of justice, and the eternal vigilance required to confront the monsters that lurk among us. Please let me know what you think of this story in the comments. If you found this story interesting, please hit the subscribe button on YouTube or whatever podcasting platform you're listening on. You can stay connected with me on Instagram and TikTok at this is Stephanie Morham. Thank you so much for listening to my very first episode. Until next time, stay safe out there.